Good evening, welcome back to Troy First Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Jeff Hartman. We just finished a seven part series on the seven things that Jesus said to the seven churches in Revelation. And tonight I start a new series, Seven Things I Wish Jesus Never Said. These days it seems everybody loves Jesus, or at least our modern Americanized version of vanilla Jesus. The one who I mentioned last Sunday morning was kind of Jesus light, tastes great, less demanding, who only says, love your neighbor and do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Kind of a cross between do-gooder Mother Teresa and can't we just all get along, Rodney King. Except that is not the actual Jesus revealed in the New Testament. I wonder, have these people actually read the life of Jesus? It wasn't his good deeds and his harmless platitudes that got him nailed to a cross. Jesus was a radical who said radical things, startling, outrageous things. Things like, and if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. Or sell what you have and give it to the poor. Hate your father and mother, wife and children. Make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. What? We're not sure we understand, but if we do, we're not sure we like it. Pluck out my eye, really? Sell what I have and give to the poor? Are you kidding me? Then I'll be poor. Hate my parents and my family? What happened to love your neighbor? Isn't it cults that alienate us from our families? What's going on here? I've entitled this series, Outrageous. Seven things that Jesus never said. And oh, there are more. I've got a book on my shelf called The Hard Sayings of Jesus, and it covers 70 outrageous things that Jesus said. I've just picked out my top seven. So let's look at the first one, and it's the first one I already mentioned. And if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. Matthew 5, 29. Verse 30, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. How do you think that went over in Jesus' day when he first said it? Did I hear you right? What did he just say? I thought he said pluck out your right eye. He did? Pretty outrageous, isn't it? Sort of ridiculous, right? Okay, okay, you don't really mean it. Jesus, what's your point? Or do you mean it? Hey, it's not just against our modern sensitivities either. They had a problem with what Jesus said too. Even his disciples said in John 6, 60, therefore many of his disciples when they heard this said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? Well, that's where that book I mentioned got its title, The Hard Sayings of Jesus. Jesus had just said something else outrageous in John chapter 6. He said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. So his disciples said, whoa, 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 that's outrageous. Not his enemies. Who can understand it? This sort of goes for all 70 outrageous statements of Jesus, doesn't it? Why couldn't he say what he meant and mean what he said? Why couldn't he have put it in a way that at least his followers would have understood? That wouldn't have confused and offended so many throughout the years. That wouldn't have given so many reason and excuse to not believe in him. Or did he actually intend to be outrageous? Friends, this is a hard saying. Can we understand it? Right up front, let's avoid two dangers. There are absolutely two ways we can't take Jesus. This is what Jesus didn't mean. First, A, we can't make the mistake of taking Jesus literally. This is a word that is overused today. It's literally raining cats and dogs outside. I'm literally starving to death. I could literally pinch your head off. Now, conservatives generally pride themselves in taking the Bible literally, but nobody does or can everywhere. The Bible is full of beautiful imagery that is lost if we take it literally. Like, the Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down. 
Well, he's not going to do that literally, right? For Psalm says, he shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will lie down. Do we literally believe that God is like a chicken? Historically, nobody has taken some of the Bible literally, especially this. When William Tyndale first translated the Bible into English, some of the old guard argued against giving the Bible to lay people in their own language because they said simple-minded people would take this very verse literally and all of England would be full of blind men who'd pluck their eyes out in obedience to God's command. They would be without hands and the kingdom would be weakened. Nonsense, argued Hugh Latimer. He says, I think we can all figure this out. And indeed, with one notable exception, Origen famously neutered himself in obedience to another outrageous statement in Matthew 19, 12. He made a eunuch of himself. There has been no follower that we know of in recorded history that has taken this command concerning eyes and hands literally. So why say it? Well, first, it wouldn't really stop the evil, would it? Remove the right eye and the left eye would take over, wouldn't it? Why, why the right eye? The right eye in a right-handed dominated world is the favorite, the stronger one. It would be more valuable to the right-handed archer. And this was thus the predominant eye. Do you know which one is your dominant eye? I had a friend show me how you could tell. If you look at something distant, like I'm looking at the back of the chapel, and I frame my hands with a triangle like this, and a little diamond shape. And then if I close one eye, all of a sudden it disappears. And then if I open that eye, I can tell which eye was the one that I was using for distance. And it happened to be my right eye. If you close your eyes one at a time, you'll determine what your dominant eye is. If you close or cover that eye, you can still see, but you have to refocus on it. If you cut off your right hand, will you no longer be able to sin? No, you just let your other hand take up the slack and you'd become a left-handed sinner, right? Surely Jesus knew that much. And it's obvious when we look at these two verses in their context. The preceding verses from the Sermon on the Mount were the familiar and somewhat outrageous Matthew 5, 27 through 29. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You see, the problem was never with the eyes in the first place. The problem was lust in the heart. So if you first pluck out one eye and then the other, the problem is not solved. Just ask a blind man. The problem is in the heart. And Jesus made clear that he understood that in Matthew chapter 15. He said, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. Jesus was exposing a fallacy when he said, pluck out your eye to avoid temptation and sin. When he said, don't look at a woman and lust after her, some might have used the excuse, well, I can't help it. I've got eye trouble. It's my body's fault. Is sin inevitable? Is lust necessary just because you have eyes? Is fornication inevitable just because you have urges? Jesus is here saying no. And the answer is not less eyes and more laws. It is a new heart. And the second problem with taking Jesus literally here and plucking out our eyes or cutting off our hands is that it would stop much good. Think for a moment of the irony of what Jesus said and how he said it. The New American Standard Bible translates it literally and says, instead of what causes you to stumble from the Greek word scandalon, it's a trap, an irony, right? Most of the time, doesn't your eye keep you from stumbling? Your eye is what keeps you from tripping over objects, right? You may not believe it, but my favorite form of exercise is rollerblading. And so almost every night I'm rollerblading around the church doing laps, and I can't do it with my eyes closed, and I can't do it with my eyes 
looking around, I have to train my eyes very carefully, scanning in front of me in the parking lot or in the street or on the sidewalk for bumps or sticks or stones, for even one stone will make me tumble. And so I have to avoid those objects. Without my eyes, I couldn't rollerblade the smallest rock or hole, and I would do a face plan on the pavement. Without my eyes, I wouldn't, it's not my feet, it's my eyes, right? Without my eyes, I wouldn't see people in need. Or what would I do without my hands? In Ephesians 5.28, Paul doesn't say, if you've got a problem with stealing, cut off your hands. No, he says, let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands. What is good? That he may have something to give him who has need. He says, if you really want to stop stealing, put your hands to use, do something good with them, work in order to give something to someone else. Fulfill needs that you couldn't see without eyes and you couldn't do without hands. I take this verse to clearly mean that the apostle did not take Jesus literally, and neither should we. So how should we take Jesus? The second danger in drawing a conclusion that Jesus didn't mean this, I believe we can't take Jesus figuratively either. Remember those figures of speech I mentioned earlier that can't be taken literally? Raining cats and dogs, literally starving, pinch your head off. Those are not to be meant to take literally or even really seriously. I'm saying that we just can't say, oh, that was just a figure of speech. I mean, we can't just dismiss this as oriental hyperbole. I mean, that we can't ignore it or explain it away, tame it, emasculate it, or neuter it. Jesus did not misspeak, and neither did he want us to just ignore it because he was exaggerating. He knew it would be outrageous, and he said it, and he said it this way on purpose because he meant it to be outrageous. He said it more than once, actually. He said it again in Matthew 18. The second time he repeated the same general outrageous principle, the context was not the heart, but harming others, especially little ones. So there he said in Matthew 18, 8, if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. And again, the eye. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. Notice the differences, hand or foot. The hand first before the eye, suppose the other time. And notice it's not the right hand or the right eye, it's just the hand or the eye. Also, the ending is somewhat more positive. You have one member perish versus life with one eye. Oh, okay, so what you really meant was poking out our eye or cutting off our hand seriously? He meant something seriously, but if we shouldn't or can't take him literally or figuratively, how do we take him? I think it's obvious he wanted us and we should take him seriously. He said something outrageous, and he said it purposefully, worded outrageously, to get our attention. So what did he mean? What deeper, radical, spiritual meaning that will probably be even more outrageous and radical should we see? Let me give you three observations on what I think Jesus did mean. First, A, this certainly is outrageous, but it is by no means irrational. You stop to think about it. Is amputation an unthinkable horror in modern medical practice? No. Did you know that every year in the U.S., 133,000 amputations take place, most often because of diabetes, to stop pain, to stop the spread of disease, even to stop death? In 1985, NFL Hall of Famer Ronnie Lott chose the amputation of the tip of his little finger that was mangled in a game. Sometimes people even practice self-mutilation, self-amputation to save their lives. In 2003, an Australian coal miner trapped under an overturned front end loader one mile underground cut off his own arm. 
tragically unnecessarily. He finished cutting it off just before emergency personnel showed up and recovered the arm, but it couldn't be attached. Also in 2003, 27-year-old Aaron Ralston, hiking in Utah, got his arm stuck under a boulder and he cut the flesh and then the bone with a pocket knife. He broke and he twisted it until he tore the two born bones to save his life. In 2007, Al Hill of California was cutting down trees when one came down on his leg, which he cut off below the knee, again with a pocket knife. Was it something that he wanted to do? No. Was it necessary? Yes. Did it save his life? Do we use it as a first resort? Of course not. It's a last resort. But here's the question. Is the sacrifice worth it to save your life? That's what 133,000 doctors and patients a year decide. Isn't that the principle in throwing cargo overboard to save the ship? Or how about throwing a man overboard to save the ship? In the story of Jonah, Jonah chapter 1, Jonah asked his shipmates to throw him overboard to save their lives. Notice he didn't jump overboard himself. Did they eagerly agree? Actually, in verse 13, when he said, pick me up and throw me into the sea, they rode hard to bring the ship to land. They didn't want to do it like the doctors. They did everything in their power to try and save the toe, to save the man. But sometimes it just can't be saved. And so when that didn't work, they finally picked up him and, verse 15, threw him into the sea, reluctantly as a last resort. And it worked. The ship was saved. In almost all cases, amputation, as drastic as it is, works. It stops the spread of disease. The life is saved. Is it a huge sacrifice to lose a limb? Yeah, ask someone who's had an amputation. It should always be used as a last resort. It is serious, painful, and irreversible. But in some cases, it's necessary and rational. In Jonah's case, they tried everything else. With diabetes and gangrene, doctors try every other kind of treatment. With sin, are we even really trying? Have you tried every other means of prevention? Certainly you can find some other prevention than amputation. That probably wouldn't even do it, right? Have you tried a new heart? What are you even willing to sacrifice? In Matthew 19, 27, Peter said to Jesus, See, we have left all and followed you. What shall we have? Look, Jesus, we've sacrificed a lot to follow you. Frankly, we've sacrificed everything to follow you. Is it worth it? Jesus says it is worth it in verse 29. Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or wife or children or lands or hand or eye or everything for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit everlasting life. Jesus says it is worth it. No sacrifice is too great for an outcome this big, this eternal. Diet and exercise are a sacrifice, but the health is worth it, isn't it? Hard work and faithfulness are sacrifices, but isn't success and fulfillment worth it? Prayer and spiritual discipline are sacrifices, but isn't the reward in this life and the next worth it? Yes, the sacrifice may be great. That's why we call it a sacrifice, even outrageous. But that's not irrational. Second observation on what I think Jesus did mean. Outrageous, but not irrational. And how about outrageous, but not negative? Yes, this is outrageous, but at the end of the day, it's not really negative, is it? The point of amputation is not removal, but continued future health. The point of sacrifice, whether diet, exercise, practice, hard work, dedication, denial, is not pain for pain's sake, but success. And spiritually, the intent of defeating sin in our lives is not repression, but fulfillment. God doesn't want us to poke out our eyes so we can see nothing, or cut off our hands so we can do nothing. He wants our eyes free to see what is beautiful, what is good, so that we can see the fields that are like to harvest. 
He wants our hands strong to do what is right, to do what is good, so we can serve him by serving others. The root to spirituality and godliness is not denial, cutting off desires and body parts until you're nothing but a stump. It's fullness and wholeness with the whole body God gave you, but with changed desires. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. He didn't come to be a killjoy. He didn't come so you might have less, but that you might have more. Not that you would have emptiness, but fullness. Not that you might lose everything, but that you might gain everything. Not that you might have sorrow, but joy. So is the route to life more abundant through amputation, less eyes, fewer hands, or better eyes, newer hands, new hearts? In Romans chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, Paul says, Do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members, eyes, hands, as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. Notice the key word there. Paul says, don't let sin reign. Not get rid of body parts. Sin is not inevitable because we have bodies, eyes, or hands. The body's not evil. Our desires, our hearts are evil. So we don't choose to let sin reign. But that's not negative. We let him reign. Don't present your parts, but that's not negative because he continues in verse 13. Present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Negative? Negative to sin, but positive to life. Rather than present yourselves and your members as instruments, do this. This is the positive replacement. Don't cut them, cut them off and present them to me as sacrifices. Keep them on. Get a new heart and be a living sacrifice, using your eyes to see needs, using your hands to meet needs. Is cleaning house fun for you? Is it a chore, a drudgery, a sacrifice? Have you ever seen the TV program Hoarders, Buried Alive? Cleaning may not be fun, but living in a clean home is. And spiritual discipline may not be fun. As a matter of fact, it may seem like an outrageous sacrifice, but living a clean life is joy unspeakable and full of glory. It is what Jesus called life more abundant. A third and final observation on what I think Jesus meant. Let us not forget that it's outrageous and it is meant to be radical. Poking out your own eye, hacking off your own arm with a pocket knife, have I got your attention? Good. Sin is dangerous. It's lethal. It's deadly. And if you simply have to hear it this way, you have to be willing to go to extreme measures to live in holiness. I'm afraid we don't take sin seriously today. Like the frog in the kettle, we've adjusted to it. You turn the, the heat up and it gets warm. If you throw a frog into the boiling water, it jumps out. But if you put it in nice warm water and you turn the heat up, you slowly cook it. That's where we are. At first, in our culture especially, it's easy to laugh at sin and then accept it and then practice it. We've become accustomed to sin. We are not fearful of it, offended by it, or ashamed of it. We've lost our ability to blush Pluck out your eye? Why, we can't even change the channel or get off that website or turn it off. We've given up. We've surrendered. We've waved the white flag. It's no use. We might as well go with the flow. Except I don't want to go with the flow because I know where the flow is going. So can't we be more like Paul who didn't blind himself or disfigure himself, but he did discipline himself? In 1 Corinthians 9, 27, he said, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Not I dismember my body. I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection lest when I've preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Who's 
the boss, do you really want to be prisoner to your every urge and temptation? You don't have to, and you probably shouldn't pluck out your eye, but you certainly must discipline your eye. What do you look at? And you don't have to, and almost certainly shouldn't, cut off your hand, but you certainly must discipline where your feet go and what your hands do. And how about disciplining your mind and your heart, what you think and what you love? I wonder if the author of Hebrews had Jesus' outrageous words from Matthew 5 in mind when he wrote Hebrews 12, 4. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. Does that characterize your struggle with sin? Or are you even struggling with sin? Resist to bloodshed? Are you even striving? I'm afraid today we've become too nonchalant and too casual about sin, especially in our own lives. Frankly, we love sin too much to leave it, let alone strive to get rid of it. If you are striving, how hard are you striving? Bloodshed? Wow, that's pretty serious. Yes, Jesus wants us to take not only him, but sin seriously. Maybe it's a bonfire to get rid of the stash. Maybe it's a confession and making yourself accountable to a friend or a mate. Maybe it's a public commitment to a new habit. What sacrifice are you willing to make? What extreme are you willing to go to to live in holiness and not denial, but more abundantly? So here's the real Jesus, not the version that everyone loves today. What the real Jesus says about sin. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. That's serious. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. Or at least be willing to. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. He even brings up that non-PC hated outrageous concept of hell here. Do you notice? Is it outrageous to shoot straight and tell the truth? How about your doctor? You want your doctor to sugarcoat it and not mention the fact that you have the C word? Do you want him to just tell you everything will be okay? To not mention the possibility or the certainty of death if you don't take the medication or the treatment or get the operation or even an amputation? Or do you appreciate her telling you the truth so you can make the best choice? So here's the truth. Sin is outrageously evil. Sin is outrageously dangerous. And death is outrageously final. Hell is outrageously real. So here is the real Jesus who says some outrageous things. He's outrageously honest, but loving and gracious. I don't know about you, but I'm going with that Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for telling us the truth, saying it like it really is. And Lord, help us to take you seriously, and in this case, to take sin seriously. Help us to strive against sin, strive even if necessary to bloodshed. Help us to live holy lives so that we can live abundant lives. In obedience to you, for in Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you for joining us. Next week, we'll take outrageous Statement number two, seven things that I wish Jesus never said. God bless. Thanks for tuning in.